complained of bone pain and a high alkaline phosphatase. And based upon these findings, the clinical team thought that this could be a possibility of a refractory rickets. But as we will discuss subsequently, that we do have some physiological responses to vitamin D, which include an uh, increase in bone pain and an uh, increase in alkaline phosphatase, which do not indicate a refractory rickets. And what we need to, really need to look at is the line of healing which was present in this case. So while this case was unnecessarily being advised, a lot of investigation in the form of a blood gas, calcitriol level and PTH, they were not required. So what we need to understand is that there are certain scenarios in which you will respond in a way and you don't need to work up extensively from that figure. So this is a normal response for rickets. On the contrary, we have this 14-year-old boy who presented to us with lower limb abnormalities predominantly and had been given huge amounts of vitamin D and there was no line of healing. He was again referred as quote unquote nutritional rickets. So in the first case, we were making physiology into pathology. Here a pathology was turned out to be in a physiological cause. And this unfortunately resulted in the development of nephrocalcinosis. If you have a late onset rickets with predominant lower limb abnormalities with a normal PTH, normal calcium, Think of hypophosphatemic rickets. So when we talk about rickets, we have to balance between the not doing too much workup where it is not required while not missing on pathological cases. So this missing and messing is something which we want to avoid. Rickets overall is a reasonably common condition, usually nutritional, but refractory rickets may pose challenge as we saw in the second case in that perspective. All of you can go and have a look at our website, learning.growsociety.in, which has got a lot of information about pediatric endocrinology, including resources and courses. Our e-learning portal on YouTube, which has got a lot of videos on pediatric endocrinology. Our validated courses, which provide information, including fellowship course and postgraduate courses as well. And our regular programs in the form of grand rounds, journal clubs, and PG lecture series as well. We've got publications across board from protocols to advanced and basic pediatric endocrinology and mobile applications which guide assessment and management in that perspective. So today, we'll talk a bit about pathophysiology of rickets, followed by etiology, which Dr. Vibha will cover, followed by management. And at the end, we'll have a very interesting Q&A session, which uh, Dr. Dhwani will be conducting, which will try to test what we have learned over this period. So this is predominantly targeted at the level of postgraduates and practicing pediatricians in that perspective. So when we talk about bone mineralization, we are talking about two important um, uh, minerals, calcium and phosphorus. And these calcium and phosphorus are deposited in the form of calcium hydroxyapatite, which is a ratio of 10 to 6 as far as calcium and phosphorus is concerned. To avoid ectopic calcification or ectopic mineralization, so to speak, body has got specific inhibitors like pyrophosphate, which inhibit the process of this mineralization. Now, this pyrophosphate is specifically degraded by an alkaline phosphatase, which is produced via the osteoblast, which degrades them, resulting in then the mineralization process. So, for the bone to mineralize, you will need calcium good amount of phosphorus as well as a good amount of ALP. If you are able to provide enough amount of calcium and phosphorus in the body, rickets will not happen. So of all the pathophysiological causes we are talking about, be it the effect of vitamin D, be it the effect of PTH, calcitonin or whatever, if we are able to maintain a good amount of intravenous calcium and phosphorus, the rickets will not develop. And this is something to remember from that regards. So calcium and phosphorus both are important. Which is more important probably here would be phosphorus. Because phosphorus is the inhibitor of growth plate apoptosis. If you have hypophosphatemia, the epiphyseal growth plate will not apoptize. Your growth plate will become bigger. And that is what is rickets in that perspective. So the basic requirement for rickets to develop is hypophosphatemia. So while we'll classify into calcopenic and phosphopenic rickets, we need to remember that nearly all forms of rickets have low phosphorus levels. One in which you have a primary problem of phosphorus will be phosphopenic. But anybody who has a calcopenic rickets will have secondary hyperparathyroidism. And that is going to cause a hypophosphatemia anyway. So phosphorus is expected to be low in everybody who has got rickets. 
If your phosphorus is high, your diagnosis goes directly towards renal failure or pseudo hyperparathyroidism as a rare possibility in that regard. Now, just to go through a bit about how this calcium and phosphorus is regulated. So, calcium is largely the chronic regulation is at the level of the intestinal absorption. You also have an acute change which happens from the bone and there is a minor effect in terms of renal calcium excretion. So, there are three major organs, the intestine, the bone and the kidneys and there are three major organs which regulate predominantly I will talk about two we have discussed a lot about calcitonin in the last time as how it is a redundant hormone as far as calcium homeostasis is concerned so most important of course is the parathyroid hormone which has got multiple effects to increase the serum calcium level it has an effect on the calcitriol production it has the effect of getting calcium out of the bones and via calcitriol, it also increases the absorption of calcium from that regards. Simultaneously, if you are wanting to increase calcium, you want to decrease phosphorus because if the phosphorus goes up, you will have unnecessarily binding of phosphorus to calcium and develop hypocalcemia. So, PTH is a potent phosphaturic substance in that regards. PTH also, as I discussed, increases the 1-alpha hydroxylase activity increasing calcitriol which is the only regulator of dietary absorption of calcium and PTH of course has an effect on bone. What about phosphorus? Now as against calcium which is very very tightly regulated by the body and we want to maintain it at normal level, phosphorus is more like an orphan. There is no single hormone which is really wanting to ensure that your phosphorus goes up. You have got PTH, which is causing a loss of phosphorus. You have got the phosphatonins, which cause phosphaturia and reducing the phosphorus levels. The only hormone which can probably increase phosphorus a bit is the calcitriol by gut absorption in that perspective. The reason for this is that phosphorus is abundant in the cells. Whatever you eat, you will always get a lot of phosphorus. So dietary phosphorus deficiency is extremely uncommon. The only condition in which you can have a phosphorus deficiency is somebody is on a total parental nutrition for a long time or you're losing more from the kidneys. So again, phosphorus, there are three players, the intestine, the bones and the kidneys. But the most important player, of course, will be the kidneys from that perspective. Now, calcitriol is very, very important in terms of increasing phosphorus level. So, calcitriol increases phosphorus absorption and you will also have more phosphorus coming from the bones in that perspective. Now, what it means is that when you are treating somebody with rickets, suppose you're treating somebody who has uh, vitamin D deficiency rickets, your phosphorus levels will be low as we'll discuss subsequently. Once you correct their vitamin D deficiency, your phosphorus will automatically get corrected. There are two mechanisms. One, if your calcium goes up, the PTH level, the hyperparathyroidism will come down and phosphaturia will come down. The second is the direct effect of calcitriol. So when you are treating rickets, most of them will be phosphopenic, but you don't need to focus on a calcium phosphate. You can very well give calcium carbonate or calcium citrate to get a good response. You don't need to give extra phosphorus in that perspective. Now, phosphorus is being excreted in the kidneys and a major regulator there is the parathyroid hormone, which we discussed. But this is not for conservation. PTH will remove. Whenever PTH is high, it will not look at what your phosphorus level is. If your phosphorus is low, it will still try to remove the phosphorus. And this becomes important in hypophosphatemic rickets. So in hypophosphatemic rickets, your phosphorus levels are low. Your PTH is low. But as soon as you increase your phosphorus level, the PTH suddenly comes into the picture and it pushes out that phosphorus. So this is a very, very difficult condition to think of. Second important factor which regulates phosphorus level is the fibroblast growth factor 23, which is like a phosphatonin. So when we talk something like a phosphatonin, it has got multiple effects. The most important effect is to cause excretion of phosphorus in the urine. Along with that, it will also be inhibiting 1-alpha hydroxylase action. Anybody who has got hypophosphatemia should have a high 1-alpha hydroxylase because you want to conserve this phosphorus and this may result in hypercalcemia. 
This is one condition which we see in infants who are on total parental nutrition, who are deficient in phosphorus. One alpha hydroxylase goes up and you will develop hypercalcemia. Now, these phosphatonins are unique in that they are not only increasing the excretion of phosphorus, they are also avoiding the unnecessary increase of calcitriol in response to this hypophosphatemia. The third major effect is at the level of PTH, they will be inhibiting PTH in that regards. And therefore, in individuals who have hypophosphatemic rickets, your FGF23 is high, you will not have hyperparathyroidism. High PTH in a child who has got refractory rickets without treatment excludes the possibility of hypophosphatemic rickets and that's something important to understand. Now, growth hormone also plays a role in conserving phosphorus from the kidneys. That's why there is some role of giving growth hormone in individuals who have hypophosphatemic rickets with growth failure. So, this will have benefits not only in terms of growth, but also in increasing their phosphorus levels as well in that perspective. Now, calcitriol and PTH both increase FGF23. And if you look at feedback, FGF23 will inhibit both calcitriol and PTH. So this is like a mechanism which we discussed already from that perspective in that regards. Now, we've talked about calcium and phosphorus, a word about a very important player in mediating both of them, which is vitamin D. So we all know that the vitamin D can be produced in the body and it's the major source is the conversion of 7-DHC under the exposure of uh, the UV light. Typically, in the Indian setting, we would need around 120 minutes, 10 to 3 p.m., which is something which is unusual for anybody to get. And that's why we've got so high levels of vitamin deficiency, which is the cholecalciferol. Or you can get the plant source, which has got a limited amount, a bit in mushrooms. And unless it's fortified, you won't get much from the food. This will be in the form of ergocalciferol. Now, choli and ergocalciferol are very similar in structure. They're like isomers. And there are some differences, but pretty much we can consider both as a single term as vitamin D. This is something to remember. Now, this vitamin D needs activation in the liver via the 25-hydroxylase to be converted into 25-hydroxy vitamin D, which is the most important marker of vitamin D status in our body. Now, 25-hydroxylase is a very unique enzyme in that its activity depends only on its substrate. So it's not limited. So often you will see that if your substrate becomes too much, the body decreases the enzyme so the toxicity becomes less. No, whatever vitamin D you take will be converted into 25-hydroxy vitamin D. So it has got two problems. If you give somebody very high doses of vitamin D, the risk of toxicity is there. The second is because this is independent of the substrate. This is independent of PTH. It is the best marker of vitamin D status in an individual. So if you want to assess vitamin D from an adequacy perspective, 25 OHT is the best marker. Now this 25 hydroxy vitamin D is activated in the kidney, the proximal tubule, via 1 alpha hydroxylase into calcitriol. And this 1 alpha hydroxylase is stimulated by PTH and inhibited by the FGF23, which we discussed. Now, remember this calcitriol then is a PTH-dependent compound. The levels of calcitriol may be low, normal, or high in vitamin D deficiency. So I often get referrals because the calcitriol is high and somebody says, okay, this is vitamin D-dependent rickets. So you've got rickets and high calcitriol. So this means it's VDDR. No, you need to understand that this may be a normal response. So unless and until you have proven that this is refractory rickets, there is no point getting a calcitriol level done. So when we talk about our algorithm, we really put calcitriol much lower down. So don't do it in everybody in routine checkup. It's a waste of money from that perspective. Now, there is also a defense mechanism which prevents the excess of vitamin D by converting it into the inactive form 24-25-dihydroxy vitamin D. This is a bit like T4 getting converted via monodiardinase 1 to T3, which is active, and the inactive form via monodiardinase 3, which is the reverse T3. So 25-OHT is a branching player. It may be activated towards 125 or inactivated towards 24-25. Drugs that increase the activity of 24-hydroxylase, like phenytoin, phenobarbitone, 
or in the presence of obesity, you will be inactivating more vitamin D and therefore you may develop rickets in that perspective. Now, in this perspective, if you have a deficiency of 25 hydroxylase, this will cause decreased production of 25 hydroxy vitamin D. If you have a deficiency of 1 hydroxylase, you will have a problem in calcitriol. Or if there is a problem in the vitamin D receptor, these all will cause VDDR of different forms, which Vibha will be talking more in that perspective. So this increases calcium and phosphorus absorption from the intestine, calcium absorption from the kidneys, and bone formation in that regard. But as I said, even if you have got zero vitamin D activity, you ensure that your serum calcium is normal, rickets will not develop. So the major role as far as vitamin D in the whole process is to provide calcium. Now you may argue that it has got effect on the growth plate, it has got effect on the bone, but no, even if you have got zero vitamin D receptor activity, it's only the intravenous calcium which is good enough to ensure the overall process in that regards. Now from this perspective, if we now look at the possible causes of rickets, it could be a phosphopenic form in which the phosphorus is the predominant problem or the calcioponic form in which the calcium is problem. But as I said, if your calcium is less, your PTH will go up and your phosphorus excretion will increase and you will be hypophosphatemic. So everybody who has got rickets is expected to be phosphopenic. So don't think that it's just that some forms are phosphopenic, but some or you can say normocalcemic hypophosphatemic would be the more appropriate term. The condition which cause phosphopenic rickets could be a generalized tubular dysfunction like Fanconi syndrome or a more specific problem like hypophosphatemic rickets. They present to us with late onset lower limb abnormalities with normal PTH and this is a characteristic finding in that regard. Vitamin D problems could be because of a low sunlight exposure, a problem in terms of low calcium intake and often we tend to forget that calcium is very very important. Now, while vitamin D deficiency is common, it has been shown in that many areas like Nigeria and India, it's actually the calcium deficiency, which is also an important contributing factor to deficiency and rickets. Remember that liver has got huge amount of 25 hydroxyl activity. So even advanced liver disease will only cause rickets. It is unusual to have rickets in liver disease if the patient is otherwise fine. So if you have a child who has got liver disease with rickets, think of two possibilities. One is malabsorption. Second is tyrosinemia or cystinosis in which you have got a liver damage, which has happened in that regards. Anti-epileptic intake like phenytoin and phenobarbitone will also cause inactivation of vitamin D, causing rickets. If you have problems in the 1-alpha hydroxylase effect like chronic kidney disease or VDDR, you will have that problem. Resistance of calcitriol action will again cause vitamin D dependent rickets and these forms will present to you with early symptomatic presentation with bone pain and tetany and high parathyroid hormone levels. Now finally we need to understand that acidosis also has a direct adverse effects on bone health and you can have proximal RTA or distal RTA resulting in failure to thrive, polyuria, nephrocalcinosis and acerotic breathing. So these are the three major groups of rickets. We will now hand over to Dr. Vibha to cover about the etiological aspects of rickets. Uh, thank you, sir. I'll be discussing more about the etiology in detail. So uh, the most common cause could be the deficiency in calcium and the vitamin D. And it has a very good therapeutic response. On the other end, we have a refractory rickets in which there is a, a lack of therapeutic response even after the adequate dose of calcium and vitamin D for 90 days. And among this refractory rickets, the other, uh, it could be calciopenic, which includes EDR1, 2, renal failure and malabsorption. They have a very early onset. They have a high PTH due to secondary hyperparathyroidism and low calcium level. On the next category, it could be it could occur in the setting of acidosis and predominantly in the distal RTA. The child will present with polyuria, failure to thrive, and of course the nephrocalcinosis. And in the last category, we have the phosphopenic cause, 
which includes the axling and the axling dominant autosomal recessive of hypophosphatemic rickets. It could be associated with Fanconi syndrome, like in the cystinemia and the tyrosinemia, and the hypercalcemic variant. They have, in comparison to the calcipenic rickets, they have a later onset and it generally involves the layer limb deformity. And in comparison to low calcium, they have normal calcium and the normal PTH level. So coming to the common cause of uh, rickets is this the calcium deficiency. It mainly occurs when there is a decreased intake of the calcium. So this increase due to the increased intake, there will be low serum calcium. And this low serum calcium will increase the PTH level, causing the secondary hyperparathyroidism, which will finally result in increased excretion of phosphate from the urine, causing the low phosphate levels. And the other cause could be the increased inactivation of the 25 hydroxyl vitamin D, and which occurs when there is increased activity of 24 hydroxylase, and which decreases the calcitriol level. So the calcium, calcium deficiency is always secondary to the vitamin D deficiency and they improve when there is the adequate calcium supplementation. And the other thing here is that if you have low calcium, that's what you're trying to suggest, is that if your calcium is low, DPS is high, the whole process is hyperactive. So you're losing out and useless products of vitamin D are also being formed. Yes, sir. So your, whatever vitamin D you are there, you become deficient as well. Yes. Now coming to the vitamin D deficiency, vitamin D deficiency could be due to the reduced sunlight exposure and this causes a decreased production of the calcitriol as the sunlight is the main uh, this substrate for the calcitriol production and this low calcitriol will increase the PTH level and if we see in the early stages of vitamin D deficiency, the calcium level is low but the phosphate level is normal. Do, uh, in response to this low calcium, what it tries to compensate with this hypocalcemia, it increases the PTH level, which tries to normalize the calcium, but it also increases the phosphate excretion from urine. So later on, we have the calcium level becomes normal, but the phosphate level decreases. And in the later stages, in the late stages, the body fails to compensate for this uh, hypocalcemia and the both the calcium and the phosphate levels are low in the late stages. So when there is a in long-standing uh, vitamin D deficiency we have a secondary hyperparathyroidism which causes the which produces the clinical feature of Fankini syndrome and in Fankini syndrome there is a generalized tubular dysfunction which causes a loss of phosphate from the urine. So if we conclude the causes of vitamin D deficiency, it is mainly due to the reduced sun exposure, malabsorption, and obesity, which causes the sequestration of vitamin D in the adipose tissue. And this Fanconi syndrome is very important to identify because you may have mild metabolism. Right, so don't confuse somebody who has a long-standing vitamin D deficiency with mild acidosis with RT. Yeah. This we have seen often getting confused in that regard. So as Sarah said, the important cause of the uh, rickets could be the chronic kidney disease and what happens in the chronic kidney disease thus there is a decreased synthesis of one alpha hydroxylate and there are many factors which have a very detrimental effect on the bone health one is a decreased synthesis of the hydroxylase the high phosphate levels which triggers the uh, which causes the high fgf23 level and which decreases the one alpha hydroxylase and there will be the low calcitriol and this low calcitriol will have will cause the secondary hyperparathyroidism and this hy secondary hyperparathyroidism will finally cause the low phosphate level. But in this chronic kidney disease, we have acidosis along with the high phosphorus. Generally, if the patient present with the rickets, we generally have low, cal low phosphorus level. But if there is a rickets and the phosphorus level is high, we should always think of there could be the cause of a chronic kidney disease and they will present with growth failure and the, they have a normal ALP level because the bone turnover is normal in the chronic kidney disease. So this is the very interesting paper as published by Dr. Anurag Bajpayee showing the various causes of refractory rickets and it clearly shows that the uh, vitamin D dependent rickets have a very early onset and uh, 
uh, along with the distal RTA, while the proximal RTA and the hypophosphatic kit will present later. And the distal RTA has a very uh, presents a very uh, have very severe features like polyuria fractures. Um, and uh, even enamel hyperplasia in contrast to the proximal RTA. And in the vitamin D dependent rickets, uh, the patient will have severe hypocalcemia that could result in the seizures as well. So now coming to the vitamin D dependent rickets, what happens here is we have, uh, there is a problem in the 1-hydroxylase synthesis. So it, uh, it results in the VDDR1. And when there is a Resistance to the action of vitamin D, um, with, uh, this leads to the vitamin uh, VDDR2. And this uh, vitamin, this VDDR1 and VDDR2 have hypocalcemia and the low phosphate levels. And they have high PTH level as a cause of uh, resulting in the secondary hyperparathyroidism. This condition is very difficult to treat and it requires a lot of, lot of, uh, uh, calcium as in the IV form. And the children who have VDR2 present with the alopecia because vitamin D is very important for the folli hair follicle growth. So these patients with vitamin D dependent rickets have a very early onset. They have severe hypocalcemia and they're very difficult to manage and requires a huge amount of IV calcium supplementation. So coming to the impure vitamin D effect, what it means the vitamin D is not working properly or not being synthesized in the adequate amount. So it could be due to defect in the activation where there is a deficiency in 25 hydroxylase as present in the VDDR1B and the advanced liver disease. It could be problem in the 1-alpha hydroxylase which results in VDDR1A and it could be due to the increased inactivation of 25 OHD to the by the increased activation of 25 hydroxylase enzyme and it is generally present in the uh, when there is a in, intake of drugs like uh, ND epileptic drugs which includes phenytoin carbamazepine etc and now coming to the VDDR2 which where there is a defect in the action of it, uh, this uh, vitamin D there is a resistance to the action of vitamin D and we have this VDDR2A where there is a uh, DNA binding defect and VDDR2B where there is a ligand binding defect. So these patients present very early, they have severe hypocalcemia and difficult to manage too. So if I summarize the inherited cause of the vitamin D effect, we have 25 hydroxylase deficiency, which is due to mutation is CYP2A1 gene. They have very low level of 25 hydroxy vitamin D low level calcitria, they present early and they present with refractory rickets. In the one, alpha, uh, one hydroxylase deficiency, it is due to mutation is 27B1 mutation and they have high 25 OHD level while the calcitria level is very low and they present with severe hypercalcemia resulting in seizures too. And in the next category of VDDR2, uh, VDDR2A is due to the defect in the DNA binding and it has both uh, high levels of 25 hydroxylase vitamin D as well as the calcitriol level. And these patients have severe hypercalcemia along with the alopecia. In the VDDR2B, there is a defect in the ligand binding and it results in high 25 OHD and the calcitriol level. And they also present with hypocalcemia. Now coming to the very important cause of the refractory rickets, that is the hypophosphatemic rickets. Generally, all the rickets have low uh, phosphate level except for the chronic kidney disease. In the, uh, the main abnormality involved uh, here in the hypophosphatemic rickets is increased synthesis of FGF23 or decreased inactivation of 20, uh, FGF23. Due to as this uh, FGF23 is a phosphate union and it increases the phosphate excretion from the urine, resulting in low serum phosphate levels. And this uh, uh, low, this FGF23 also inhibits the activity of 1 alpha hydroxylate, resulting in the low calcitriol. And when their calcitriol level is low, it decreases the calcium absorption from the intestine. So this Hypophosphatemic rickets could present as isolated form when there is a fixed uh, fixed fixed gene de defect when there is a mesenchymal tumors and it can be associated with Fankini syndrome. Uh, 
uh, which includes uh, cystinosis, tyrosinosis, in case of Wilson disease also, and when there is a heavy metal poisoning. So, if I categorize the hypophosphatemic rickets, it could be congenital, which involves, which is HGA23 dependent, where there is a, where the levels of HGA23 is high. It includes the PES6 gene defect, which is X-link dominant, TMP1 defect, which is autosomal recessive, ENPP1, which is also autosomal recessive, and the uh, GNAS mutation, which is present in the macula albright syndrome. And where, uh, the another character includes the FGF23 independent, where the FGF23 level is normal. It is also uh, known as the hypophosphatemic rickets with hypercalciuria because the um, calcium um, because this uh, uh, calcitriol level uh, action is preserved in this condition and it is due to it is present in NPT2A and C gene defect and also the DEN syndrome. It's very important to identify this variant because the urinary calcium is high. I have. And if you give them calcium, it will further increase. In the acquired causes, the mesenchymal tumor, melanocytic nervous syndrome, and the epidermal nevi. And these causes hyperphosphatic rickets because they produce F, uh, this FGR23 from the tumor cells. Now, coming to the very important cause of the uh, uh, this refractory rickets, and it includes the renal tibular acidosis. So, in the proximal RTA, there is an abnormality in the bicarbonate filtration. And uh, the kidney will filter the bicarbonate until the level of bicarbonate becomes very low. When the uh, level is very low in the blood, the filtration of bicarbonate stops. And this leads to the acidic urine. This condition is self-limiting. And uh, also the, there is a presence of acidic urine. And there will be no nephrocalcinosis. On the other hand, when there is a distal RTA, there is a defect in the acidification of the urine. This condition is very severe present with fractures, and the differentiating feature is that they have alkaline urine and presence of nephrocalcinosis. While the other hand, type 4 RT, which is the hypercalemic uh, RTA, uh, it doesn't cause any rickets. So uh, I'll say uh, we have to look for the phosphate level first because uh, it will clearly rule out whether it includes a uh, chronic kidney disease or it is the other form of uh, rickets and then we have to go further as the sir will discuss later. So thanks a lot Dr. Viva for uh, making the etiology part very clear. We will now move forward with regards to assessment and management. So the key questions that we have to answer in terms of the overall part of rickets is, is it really rickets? That's the first question of course. Then if it is rickets, is it refractory or not? And finally, what's the cause? So, uh, when we talk about rickets, we of course are talking about bony deformity. So, we are all aware about the classical deformity like genuvalgum, genuvarum and windswept deformity. What you need to understand is that there is a physiological genuvarum which happens in infancy. So, if you have a genuvarum, there are no wrist widening, there is no other changes, don't be too much worried about that. But if you have a windswept deformity... Or if you have a clear-cut genovalgum, this is a pathological cause which you have to worry, of course. And then X-ray will give you a good picture. You can look at the, the hand X-ray, which gives a good picture, or even the knee X-ray. And we talk about the cupping, <clears throat> which is basically the widening and there is a gap there. Fraying, which is the irregularity and splaying, which is the pressure the bone is forming on a weak bone, causing it to splay out from that perspective. Now, the next big question before you want to evaluate is, is it really refractory? So, we have to follow the protocols as far as the treatment are concerned. There are global recommendations which are also there and IAP has also come up with their own recommendations for vitamin D treatment, which basically in most cases beyond one year, they're talking about 3,000 international units every day. So, this is something which we would like to recommend, 3,000 international units daily for 12 weeks. And alternatively, you can use 60,000 units in uh, fortnightly every two weeks. Now, the big message here is that injectable forms are not recommended because they will cause very rapid rise and rapid fall of vitamin D and they will have a risk of hypercalcemia. They are specifically reserved only for malabsorption. Always remember that you also give uh, with calcium as well because if you have calcium deficiency, you will again have issues in that perspective. So, give for 12 weeks and then reassess 
And then, of course, once you have treated it, you have to give a maintenance level of vitamin D in that regard. And parental vitamin D only if there is malabsorption. Once you give vitamin D in the right doses, the chances of toxicity are very, very less. So don't worry about toxicity. But if you give a high dose, if you give a parental therapy for a longer duration, there may be a risk. Now, what happens when you treat, when you give vitamin D, your calcium absorption increases, your phosphorus absorption increases, so your calcium levels go up, you will have bone formation, calcium goes up, PTH goes down, so phosphorus up automatically improves on that. Now, once you have got this deposition, you may have hypocalcemia if you are not giving calcium. This is what is known as a hungry bone syndrome. And you may also have bone pain because of bone formation. So this is a normal phenomena. Do not worry about this and think that this could be a feature of refractory rickets. Now, because of rickets, the bone turnover was low. Once you have treated, the bone turnover increases. And as we have said that your bone formation markers like ALP levels will go up because they are required as part of the bone formation. So this high ALP does not mean that you have got a refractory rickets. So this is something you need to understand. So when we are thinking of refractory rickets, we need to first of all be sure that you have rickets. Second, you should give enough dose of calcium and vitamin D and then you do not find a line of healing. This is what is important. The misguiders are high ALP, low calcium and bone pain which may happen as a normal response which you need to be aware of. Remember that other conditions may look like rickets particularly skeletal dysplasia. And we know many of them are specifically having the epiphyseal involvement. <clears throat> pseudo hypoparathyroidism will present with hypocalcemia and hyperphosphatemia. Uh, Fluorosis, especially in endemic regions, and you have to examine the teeth. They will look yellowish discoloration and you will have osteosclerosis, which are the characteristic features. And hypophosphatasia in which the ALP levels will be very, very low. You do not need to wait in everybody who comes to you with rickets. Okay, I'll wait for a few months for response. If already the child has significant polyuria, fractures, failure to thrive, you have to start thinking that this could be an abnormality. Three-year-old boy with rickets giving a dose of vitamin D, 60,000 units, which we discussed earlier. And we said that high ALP and bone pain does not mean refractory rickets. This is a normal response. So don't worry about that and follow up. Four-year-old girl given osteocalcium, 5 ml BD without being given any vitamin D. So this clearly is inadequate treatment. And she was labeled as refractory rickets. So this is not really refractory rickets. This is something which we don't need to worry. This is inadequate treatment from that perspective. Seven-year-old girl with refractory rickets with a high phosphorus. So you can see that she is short. She has classical lower limb abnormality, but the phosphorus is high. The first thing I'll think about is renal failure, which was normal, which is creatine was normal. So this turned out to be pseudo hypoparathyroidism. So PHP may present masquerade as uh, vitamin D uh, as rickets and then you don't need to worry too much about. On the contrary, if you have long standing vitamin D e deficiency, you may also have secondary PTH resistance. So you have to be very cautious. Get a vitamin D level done in this scenario. If your vitamin D is low, then you have to think of vitamin D deficiency first as a possibility. But yes, hypocalcemia, hyperphosphatemia, normal creatinine with rickets, think PHP as a possibility, as an alternate diagnosis in that regards. Now we know it's refractory. How do we evaluate for cause? If you have clear-cut history of tetany, spasm, cramps, think of a calcipenic rickets. If it's polyuria, think of RTA. If there is a predominant lower limb involvement, think of a phosphopenic form of rickets. If there is anemia with rickets, think of celiac or kidney disease. If there is alopecia, as Vibha said, vitamin dependent rickets would be a likely possibility. Get an eye examination done for corneal crystals, which will indicate cystinosis. If there is hemangioma, this could be a FGF producing tumor. And fluorosis, as I said, mottling of teeth, yellow discoloration. Think about these possibilities. If there is significant growth failure, renal calcification, hypokalemic paralysis, polyuria, acidotic breathing, think RTA as a strong possibility. If there is a late onset, lower limb abnormality, coarse tabaculations, dental abscesses, and thesopathies, spinal stenosis, think of a possibility of hypophosphatemic rickets as we showed. So this is what our study was and what we really look at in this perspective is 
that biochemical investigation will give you a clue. Of course, phosphorus levels will be low in most cases. Alkaline phosphatase is interesting. They will be lower in distal RTA compared to other forms because distal RTA is a low bone turnover state. So ALP will give you a clue. Phosphorus levels and calcium levels will also give you a clue. So if your calcium is low, it pretty much excludes the possibility of hypophosphatemic rickets from that perspective. Now, if you look at phosphorus level, remember that as the bones are growing, and bone formation happens, you will have a higher level of phosphorus. So use age appropriate cutoff rather than the adult cutoff, which are often given in many of these references in this perspective. Now, why often we spend a lot of time in measuring the urinary phosphorus excretion to identify whether there is really phosphaturia or not. There are various ways of doing it. You can look at the fractional excretion of phosphorus, which is basically the urinary phosphorus upon plasma phosphorus into plasma creatinine upon urinary creatinine. Standard way we calculate the fractional part. This can then be converted into a tubular resorption, which is 100 minus this amount, how much phosphorus you are absorbing. And you can also convert it for the phosphorus level and GFR level, which is the TMP GFR. So, Tubular maximum of phosphorus for GFR is considered to be the best marker as far as the phosphorus excretion status is concerned. A lot of people do a lot of investigations or the problems are you need timed collections of phosphorus. Some people talk about spot collection and there is so much variations there. Now, how important is this test really in terms of assessment? Now, you remember this. TMP GFR, this formula says is phosphorus minus this level. So, whenever your phosphorus level is low, your TMP GFR will anyway be low. So, rather than doing so much academic exercises, if your phosphorus is low, you, you have to understand that everybody who is eating should not have a low phosphorus. If somebody is in the ICU on TPN, then I can understand. If somebody has hypomagnesemia, I can understand. But otherwise, in a normal individual, low phosphorus means that you have a renal loss. So don't worry too much about this. Low phosphorus, I'll be very confident that this is because of excretion. And your normal value of 4 to 8, if your actual phosphorus level is 2, why bother about TMP GFR? It has to be low in that perspective. Urinary calcium excretion can give you a direct clue for RTA. So you have to do a 24-hour or a spot sample if you have got hypercalciuria more than 4 mg per kg per day or 0.25 mg to milligram, you are worried about hypercalciuria and particularly think of a possibility of RTA, hypophosphatemic rickets with hypercalciuria or dense disease as a possibility in that regards. Now, RTA is an important differential to consider. For RTA, you need to have acidosis, which is basically metabolic of origin with a normal level of anion gap, normal level of renal functions and ammonia excretion which indicates a positive urinary anion gap. So this is the workup you will consider for RTA. Now if we now classify rickets and the common conditions I put out are VDDR, hypophosphatemic, RTA, renal failure, the most important investigation is phosphorus. Everybody who has got rickets will have a normal level of phosphorus. If your phosphorus is high, you're dealing with renal failure or pseudohypoparathyroidism. If your calcium level is low, it excludes hypophosphatemic rickets. If your PTH is high, it excludes untreated hypophosphatemic rickets. High urinary calcium indicates renal tubular acidosis and pH will of course give you acidosis in RTA and renal failure. So these are the way you can understand and get the diagnosis from that perspective, which will be identified in that regard. So based upon this, we propose an algorithm, maybe around 18 years ago, and our current algorithm is slightly different, but quite similar. So if you have a patient with rickets, assess the response to vitamin D. We talked about 3,000 international units beyond one year or 60,000 international units fortnightly for 12 weeks. Assess for response, if there is a response of vitamin D in the form of line of healing, don't worry. End of the story. If your rickets is not responding and your phosphorus level is low, you've got multiple differentials. Three major differentials, RTA, hypophosphatemic rickets and VDDR. So you look at blood gas. If there is acidosis, this is RTA. You classify based upon 
uh, uh, urinary pH, you can use fraction excretion of bicarbonate, you can do a urine to blood CO2 difference to identify distal versus proximal RTA. Mild metabolic acidosis should not raise the possibility of uh, rickets here as RTA. Think of secondary hyperparathyroidism also in that regard. One condition I find often confusing to identify is proximal RTA, which may not have acidosis all the time. Urinary pH may be variable. So look for other signs. Look for urinary glucose. So if the glucose is there, often we miss it. This will be indication that this could be Fankini syndrome. If the blood gas is normal and your calcium, phosphoric, uh, calcium and PTH are also normal, this is hypophosphatemic rickets. If, however, you have got low calcium or high PTH, this is vitamin D dependent rickets. You classify based upon calcitriol, which is high in VDDR2 uh, and normal in VDDR1. So, if you now look at the algorithm, calcitriol is only indicated in refractory rickets with normal phosphorus, normal blood gas, hypocalcemia or hyperparathyroidism. So, if you do random, everybody calcitriol, your levels will cause confused and you will label everybody as VDDR2. So, this is something which has to be avoided. Now, of course, if your phosphorus is high, your diagnosis becomes easy. Your creatinine is high. This is renal failure. Alternatively, you're looking at PHP. So, mainly looking at the response to vitamin D, phosphorus, blood gas, and then maybe vitamin D, 125, you will get the diagnosis in most cases. So, four-year-old girl rickets two courses of vitamin D, no improvement, also has abdominal pain and anemia. So, parental vitamin D was given and there was a response. So, what are you thinking here, Dr. Dhani, in this case? Yeah. So, this was one case in which we gave the parental vitamin D because we were suspecting malabsorption and TTD was strongly positive. So, consider celiac as a possibility. Five-year-old girl with rickets and polyuria, you see significant failure to thrive. There is metabolic acidosis with a high urinary pH labeled as distal RTA. Do you agree, uh, Viva? Sir, so, so, as we said, you need to have a normal anion gap, you need to have a normal urinary anion gap, and you need to have a normal creatinine. So, in this case, we have uh, bypassed the picture. So, here the phosphorus was very high, and we should have thought of CKD. So, it's a renal acidosis, but it's a renal glomerular acidosis rather than a renal tubular acidosis, so to speak. Four year old boy with rickets, calcium is 8.2, potassium is 3.8. Phosphorus, ALP, are, ALP is definitely on the higher side. There is a metabolic acidosis minus 6.5. What do you think? So, first presentation doesn't have any history of giving vitamin D. So, this is a mild acidosis and as I said, if it's distal RTA, very unlikely. Proximal, yes, but you don't have any other manifestations. Proximal RTA presents much earlier in age. So, what we're seeing here is that this is not fitting into RTA. It is actually vitamin D deficiency causing secondary hyperparathyroidism. So, you have to be wary about false diagnosis of RTA as well. Two-year-old girl with failure to thrive in rickets and you can see clear-cut features of rickets. There is significant bone abnormality, including loser zone. She is failing to thrive as well. Phosphorus is 1.9, ALP is 1200. Is it hypophosphatemic rickets? Um, calcium is normal. Okay, this was labeled as hypophosphatemic rickets. Now, what I need to understand is that if you have to do a blood gas first in this regard, and there was mildish metabolic acidosis, very early onset, mild metabolic acidosis, very low phosphorus, very high ALP. This is proximal RTA. And your job is not done once you diagnose proximal RTA. You have to look at the eye examination, genetic testing, so tyrosinemia, cystinosis, and all those can become in that perspective. 12-year-old girl with multiple fractures, as you can see here. 
and very, very weak bone failure to thrive polyuria and myopathy. There is metabolic acidosis, as you can see. Creatinine is normal and anion gap is normal. So this is RTA. Now, what do you think? This is distal or proximal RTA? So this is more severe, more fractures, more likely distal RTA. Urinary anion gap was positive. Again, confirming RTA. What you are seeing here is urinary pH is 5.8. This is alkaline. Again, RTA, but there is amino acid urea. So, Fancani syndrome. So, secondary hyperparathyroidism can cause that. So, late onset, severe disorder, fractures, alkaline urine. Think of distal RTA. Don't get too bothered about this amino acid urea. This is part of the Fancani syndrome picture, which is there in that perspective. So, this is important. Three-month-old boy with seizures, rickets, and what we are seeing, phosphorus is very, very low. PTH calcium is also low. Vitamin D is 40. Calcitriol is 200. So, what are you dealing with? So this looks like your calcitriol is there, your vitamin D is there, it's not working. So we did here two in that regard. One year old girl with refractory rickets, calcium is 6.9, phosphorus is 2.2. So phosphorus is low, calcium is low, ALP is high. PTH is also very high. Now, vitamin D is high and calcitriol is 10. Yeah. So, this is a classical scenario that you are thinking of VDDR. And again, there is a confusion between VDDR and proximal RTA, which may be a part of the secondary hyperpara. So, we give calcitriol and that would result in improvement. So, again, VDDR1 will be hypocalcemia. This will be less severe than VDDR2. But yes, you have to consider this in appropriate situation. This case you already discussed. So, uh, Vibha, we have this guy, a girl with phosphorus, a child with phosphorus of 1.8. Base excess is minus 4. Calcium and PTH are both normal. So, what are you thinking of? So, this is most likely a hypophosphatemic rickets. Now, very important is to look at urinary calcium here as well. If you have hypercalciuria, you are dealing with hypercalciuric variant of hypophosphatemic rickets. Go for a family history, especially ask for maternal uncles, cousins. Even mother may have milder disorder because it's an X-linked dominant disorder. And this family history will give you a diagnosis of X-linked hypophosphatemic rickets in that regard. Six-year-old boy with no response to therapy, calcium is normal, phosphorus is 2.2, ALP is high, PTH is normal. Calcitriol and vitamin D was advised. Do you agree? So there was no response. It's a refractory rickets. Okay. So blood gas was normal in this case. And now this child was on calcitriol, complaints of abdominal pain, polyuria, dehydration. What are you thinking of? So, hypophosphatemic rickets with possibly hypercalciuric variant. So, it's very, very important to really look at urinary calcium. Look at ultrasound before you start treatment because otherwise you will have nephrocalcinosis which will develop in this scenario. 16-year-old boy with rickets, very low level of phosphorus. Now, ALP is very high. PTH is normal. So, we are dealing with hypophosphatemic sort of a physiology. Now, family history is not there. No hypercalciuria. So, what are you thinking of? So, you have to consider some acquired cause because it's a late onset. Why would it be so late? So, generally you have to look for imaging. Genetic study was normal. MRI showed a soft tissue tumor. And if you remove that tumor, 
that will improve. So, this is tumor induced osteomalacia where the tumor is producing FGF23 and that will improve from that regards. So, all this algorithm we have developed our approach pathway which guides you in terms of assessment which is available as part of our app provides the right diagnosis in most cases. Now, coming out of the management part, I think we already discussed about the nutritional rickets. For the other way, the treatment is quite simple. For distal RTA, you give bicarbonate and you give supplemental vitamin D. Proximal RTA, the bicarbonate requirements are very high along with phosphorus. VDDR1, you require high dose calcitriol and calcium. And uh, VDDR2, you need very, very high dose of calcitriol and hypophosphatemic rickets is a complicated scenario. So, we'll discuss a bit of it. So, distal RTA, once you give bicarbonate, the usual dose initially may be high, but then you need 1 to 2 millimoles per kg per day. And this will result in resolution of acidosis and your potassium levels will improve. So, they have hypokalemia, which improves with treatment. For proximal RTA, you need much higher doses of uh, bicarbonate. And this results in a load of sodium resulting in a potassium loss causing worsening of hypokalemia. So, you have to give them enough amount of potassium as a supplement and also phosphorus and sometimes thiazide diuretics may be required. For hypophosphatemic rickets, what you have to do is to give phosphorus around 30 to 50 milligram per kg per day. Do not give too much phosphorus at a time. If you give more phosphorus at a time, PTH will get up and it will remove in the urine. Now, whenever you do that, you will also need to give calcitriol because there is also a deficiency of calcitriol which happens in the setting of this scenario. And if you have hypocalcemia, you will have hyperparathyroidism, which is going to cause a lot of problems. Phosphorus will come down and you will also have a problem of tertiary hyperparathyroidism, which may evolve over time. So, you don't want to give too much. In this case, you can give calcitriol and you can also give a calcimimetic like synacalcid which can also suppress the, the parathyroid level in this perspective. If you give, however, too much calcitriol, there's a risk of nephrocalcinosis, which you need to be bothered about. Use thiazide diuretics as required. The most specific and the most promising therapy is the monoclonal antibody against FGF23, which is available as an injectable burosumab, which is quite helpful and causes a physiological response in the setting of hypophosphatemic rickets. And that's something which is important. Very importantly, do not miss the hypercalciuric variant. In this scenario, you do not need to give calcitriol. In this perspective, this is the NP22 variants. So, you have to give phosphorus at around 40 mg per kg per dose in divided dosage. Calcitriol, again, vary in terms of the various responses. You can also use alpha calcitriol if there is no renal dysfunction. And phosphorus, there are various preparations available. The neutral phosphorus preparations in the form of sachets are quite helpful. Alternatively, you can make your own phosphorus in the form of inorganic phosphorus, which is there. The key things to look at are growth, which should be normal. Phosphorus levels, don't worry if they are low, because often you will not be able to achieve a very high level of phosphorus anyways. ALP should be targeted at a high normal level. If your ALP is high, you increase the phosphorus dose. If your PTH is high, that is two to three times above the upper limit, you increase calcitriol. If despite adequate doses of calcitriol and normal calcium, it is not coming down, this may be emerging towards a tertiary hyperparathyroidism. You can think of synacalcet as a calcimimetic in that regards. Monitor hypercalciuria to avoid nephrocalcinosis and annual ultrasound will be required in this scenario and look for x-ray for response. You have to be very cautious. So, hypophosphatemic rickets requires a lot of evaluation in terms of management and follow-up. So, we have a child with hypophosphatemic rickets on phosphorus 40, calcitriol 30, phosphorus is 2, PTH is 200. What will you do here, Adhwani? <coughs> So, we can push the calcitriol dose a bit and reduce phosphorus also because you don't worry about this phosphorus level because you're giving too much phosphorus and you're getting less calcitriol. After two years, phosphorus was 30, calcitriol was 25, now has polyuria and abdominal pain.
So there is hypercalciuria and renal calcification. So you have to definitely think of reducing the dose, adding thiazide, which is also going to help in that regards. VDDR management is a bit challenging. For 25 hydroxylase, you give calcium and you will have a response. For a problem in VDDR 1A, you would need to give a high dose of calcitriol to begin with because the initial phase for healing, you need high calcitriol and then you come down. The dose is 150 to 200 nanogram per kg per day, which is roughly 6 to 8 times the normal dose. Now, why are we doing that? Remember when we talked about the IAP guideline, they are saying 600 for maintenance and 3000 for treatment. So, 5 times. Same here, 25 to 50 is the normal dose, but you need to give 150 to 200. So, you need an initially high dose of vitamin D in that regards. 24 hydroxylase you can manage with vitamin D. VDDR2 is a nightmare. You need a huge amount of calcitriol which is required and some patients may require IV calcium in that perspective. So, now we've discussed a lot about these things. We can now move forward in terms of the Q&A with Rickets. Nee. So, you, we'll look into that. So, you can carry from here. So this will be in the form of Q&A and all of you can uh, write down in the Q&A option the answer. So we'll get, we'll announce the person who answers for the first time. The first time. Uh, so uh, here we start off with something simple. What is the earliest manifestation of vitamin D deficiency in infants? So you can put your response. The Q&A. Thank you. Uh, so, Dr. Parani Raman is saying head sweating as an important manifestation which is there. Anybody else has any answers? So, we are asking mainly in terms of skeletal manifestation, I believe. So, growth deficiency, tetany, so what are you talking about? Yeah. So, skeletal manifestation, this is what we are hmm. talking which you can pick up very quickly. Hmm. But other manifestations as yeah. we have talked about are growth failure, head sweating and other parameters may also be there. And uh, if people could answer, what other conditions may have this sign, especially for the general pediatricians or people giving entrance exams, you may need so one of the two. other causes of cranial tears other than the kids. Yeah. Uh, we are looking for answers. Not yet. What is your answer? Okay. So, congenital rubella and osteogenesis is imperfect and may uh, have cranial tears early. Uh, also, what radiological uh, sign or what radiological imaging would you advise in an infant with rickets? So, for infant with rickets, what specific uh, parameter you will ask for? We will uh, look for the answers on that. X-ray of the left hand. Yeah. So, yeah. left hand risk is the most common. Dr. Parani Raman uh, from Pondicherry has correctly okay. answered that. It's very important. You can also look at the chest X-ray. And chest x-ray is important because especially if you're looking at a very young child in which you want to look for hypophosphatasia, you may find ribs which are very, very small and you may have practice. So even otherwise, hand is a very good x-ray to go forward. And as so Dr. Gurbinder, Dr. Marani, Dr. Musa Kurti, all of them are saying x-ray. So this is very precise. They carry on. As the child gets older and starts bearing weight on the lower limb, you will see changes in the knees. But initially, you may not see changes there. Uh, so, uh, we have a 1.5, one and a half month old, apparently well infant who presented with generalized tonic seizures. Uh, we ruled out sepsis and uh, hypoglycemia here. And the next thing that we see is that calcium was 5.2, phosphorus was 8.3. So, hypocalcemia with hyperphosphatemia in a infant with, uh, with the uh, seizures. Yeah. Seizure, yes. So, we saw that the calcium was low, phosphorus was high. We went ahead with PTH levels and we saw that it was elevated. So, what is the diagnosis here? And is there anything else you would like to work up before? So, hypocalcemia, hyperphosphatemia, do they have any rickets also? Nickel? No other features. No, no other features. So, well hypocalcemia, hyperphosphatemia, what are we looking at? PTH is also high. So, is it pseudo-hypoparathyroidism? So, we are looking for answers. Dr. Parani Raman is saying pseudo-hypoparathyroidism. Dr. Yeah. Bharani is talking about neonatal uh, hypoparathyroidism. So, so you have to, of course, look at uh, it is basically a scenario of 
hypocalcemia with hyperphosphatemia and a high PPS. In a normal universe, you will say this is most likely a pseudo so yeah. But we know that there is a significant chance of vitamin D deficiency causing PPS resistance. So it's actually a deficiency of vitamin D which is causing this resistance. Dr. Gurbinder Sekho has correctly mentioned hypo a vitamin D mm -hmm. deficiency. So, what are the mechanism of vitamin D deficiency causing this high phosphorus? Um, so, the vitamin D deficiency causing high phosphorus. So why is this not associated with hypophosphorus? Yeah, PTS resistance. Uh, Second, PTS Second, resistance. Yes, yes. Next. Week. Again, we have a three month old, apparently well infant with generalized tonic seizures. We've ruled out uh, sepsis and hypoglycemia. We find that the calcium is 5.6. Here now the phosphorus is 2.1. Um, we did not want to make the same mistake again. We went ahead with the vitamin D levels, which is in the normal range. PTH again in this setting is now high. So you have high PTH, normal vitamin D, hypocalcemia, and hypophosphatemia. So what are you looking at here? It's different from the last case. Vitamin D is normal. You would definitely like to look at whether there are rickets on the x-ray of the chest or on the hand. Is it there? Uh, clinically, there was no rickets. Only seizure was the manifestation. Okay, so yeah. Any considerations here? So this is clearly a case which is not vitamin deficiency. This is not pseudo-hypoparathyroidism or hypoparathyroidism. This is a vitamin D related cause. So we are looking at VGDR as a possibility. Mm -hmm. So, VGDR2 mm. or 1, whatever we yeah. have uh, not done the calcium uh, level, you have done it's high. Yeah. So, this is VGDR2. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 14 month old uh, boy who presented with rickets. Uh, now, we saw that the weight was normal, but the uh, there was stunting. We saw that there was the calcium was low, the phosphorus was normal, ALP was elevated, and we did the vitamin D levels, which came out to be low. Uh, low. We got the nutritional history and found out that the child was exclusively breastfed, did not receive supplements, and we established that this was a nutritional rickets. Now, I wanted to know what treatment uh, would you prescribe to this child? So we have a one-year-old child who has nutritional deficiency. What sort of treatment in terms of calcium dose, in terms of vitamin D dose and formulation you will use? So, yeah. um, while we are waiting for the answers, uh, uh, do you think you would think of a refractory rickets also as a possibility in this case or you are fine? Uh, not upfront knowing that history was classically suggestive uh, of uh, a deficiency. So you have brought so my ingredients that I was not very excessive. Hmm. Vitamin D levels are very low so I would not be too concerned hmm. about that. So Dr. Bharani is talking about 60,000 fortnightly. Dr. Musa Kuti also the same. Dr. Padani Raman, calcium, vitamin D and protein calorie supplements. I think we have to do that. What is your take on this? Okay, so I wanted to uh, raise another question. At calcium of 5.2, would you uh, like to do something else differently, at least in the initial part? Um, this is a very important scenario that if you have hypocalcemia, if you give them vitamin D, it's going to take a long time for this vitamin D to get corrected and this calcium level to normalize. So in this scenario, you need to probably give a more rapid acting preparation okay. like calcitriol in the initial phase for three to five days as we just did in the other case and okay. you will build up the calcium levels and then go forward from there. I think this is an important point uh, that if you have severe hypocalcemia with rickets, correct with calcitriol also in the initial phase. Yeah. Um, nine month old girl with craniotape. Okay. What happened? I... Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, nine month old girl with craniotapes and uh, widened wrist and birth weight. She was a term three kg uh, baby. As you can see on the x ray, there are classical features of rickets. Uh, now, this uh, child, uh, there was a history that, the she, that she was growing well almost until six months of age, and beyond six months, the mother has noticed uh, weight loss. And uh, as you can see, for a nine month old, her weight and length both are compromised. Uh, there's classical history of passing pale colored stool, recent onset, bleeding manifestations, and distension of abdomen. So, uh, what uh, are you considering here? I mean, what diagnosis would you consider here? And how would she you like to manage? Which has not responded to vitamin D, or you don't have a history. 
we don't have a history yet but she's a nine month old baby who has presented with features of rickets and has uh, failed to thrive with so dr karani is mentioning celiac in the box could you talk about that uh, i'm not in a nine month old no yes the gluten exposure will be less so yes, yes. we are talking about some malabsorption yes. but what form we look at the liver disease yes. as a possibility so cholestasis of the grow dr balani Dr. Musa Kurti, Dr. Sushma Kaur is mentioning malabsorption. Yes. yes, so a form of hepatic malabsorption. Yes. We are looking at, and as we discussed, that liver disease does not cause rickets yes. unless it's very advanced, or you have significant malabsorption, yes. or you have tyrosinemia, cystinosis, or other things. So, so what did we do further? So this was basically on workup found out to be biliary atresia. And what are the micronutrient deficiencies? Would you expect uh, to simultaneously coexist in such children? So. So there will be a lot of parts of the nutrient deficiency which you have to be worried about. This two and a half year old boy presented to an orthopedic surgeon with knock knees and gait abnormality basically. And again, we can see in the uh, X-ray of the knee that there is some uh, metaphyseal cupping, uh, spleen fraying. Yes. The weight and length were not uh, quite compromised. So this child had received vitamin D uh, intramuscular six lakh units and at even at 12 weeks, we saw that there was no line of healing. Now, this child definitely qualifies as a refractory rickets. On workup, we found that the cal calcium was 8.1, phosphorus 2.1, vitamin D was 200, and PTH was 70. So, low level of phosphorus and calcium, vitamin D is high, PTH is mildly elevated. So, what are we looking at as a possibility? Maybe we want to have the answers. Hypophosphatemic rickets, do you agree? PTH being high. And not so young. Right, yeah, we are type 2. So you can't say at the moment, yeah. yes, but yeah. we are looking for Parani with BDDR. So it's mostly BDDR 1 or 2, so calcitonin levels will be done. So I think that algorithm will give us a two in this regard. Yeah. Uh, now we have a 5 year old boy who presented with bowing of legs. The weight was significantly compromised, height slightly. He had uh, severe pallor and history of frequent diarrhea and pica. And this is what we see uh, on examination. So there is definitely a lot of clubbing. So we have given the diagnosis, but already right. Dr. Palani and Dr. Panani yeah. mentioned celiac as a possibility. So if you have rickets with anemia, with clubbing, think of celiac as a possibility. Dr. Bro was also mentioned celiac. Yeah. Please go ahead. Uh, we had this three-year-old girl with resistant rickets. She presented an history of polyuria. Uh, height and weight was significantly compromised. The blood gas showed a pH of 7.18 uh, with bicarb of 11.7 and a urinary pH of 5.6. So you have acidosis with a urinary pH which is alkaline. Yes. Acidic blood, alkaline urine, problem in acidification. So the diagnosis is RTA2, Dr. Guru, Dr. Bahan, both of them have talked about that. But is there something else you would like to uh, rule out here before you yeah, label this that. child as an RTA? Yeah. So again, creatinine will become important yeah. as we saw in that case. So before you diagnose, and Dr. Guru has mentioned again creatinine, yeah. so you have yeah. to look at creatinine before you label it RTA. And this child has a very classical frontal bossing and rachitic rosary, if I may just point out. Yeah. Now we had 11 year old boy uh, admitted with vomiting, dehydration and uh, failure to thrive who had height of 124 centimeters, weight of 20 kgs. Both were significantly compromised. As you can already see in the x-rays, there are uh, racketic changes on the wrist as well as knee uh, joints. Sodium was normal, potassium was 2.1. He had a pH of 7.25 with an anion gap of 12. Metabolic acidosis with normal anion gap. Now, metabolic acidosis with a normal anion gap. Uh, further workup in view of uh, rickets showed that uh, calcium was 8.6 and phosphorus 1.9 with a very high ANC level. So, and you have a normal reaction. So, what are we looking at in this child who has got acidosis, who has got hypophosphatemia, high ANC, and a normal reaction? Proximal RTA, Dr. Musa Kutti, Dr. Bhanani saying RTA, what do you think now? Okay. 
So Absolutely. it's more like the RT, yeah. and then you classify it further. Mm -hmm. The reason why you probably this RT was a bit less because the AMC was very high, but you can have variation as well. So again, this is considered RT. Uh, now, this was a very interesting case. She was a three-year-old girl who had initially presented with failure to thrive in polyuria. Uh, she underwent a battery of investigations, was advised treatment, but they not really uh, com they were not compliant to the treatment. She presented again at nine years of age with persistence of polyuria. Now, in view of persistence of polyuria, the uh, attending pediatrician had done a uh, urine routine which had shown glycosuria. So they went ahead with uh, glucose blood, blood sugar profile and they saw that the blood sugar fasting and postprandial were normal. The HbA1c was in the normal range. And with this presentation, she was referred to an endocrinologist saying that the urine glucosuria does not match with the current investigation. Uh, when she was seen by us, she had uh, features of rickets and we went ahead with further, further workup, which showed sodium of 140, potassium was borderline low, uh, creatinine, at nine years of 0.8 was not significantly elevated. She had calcium of 8.1, phosphorus of 1.9, of metabolic acidosis with pH of 7.2 and a normal anion gap. So there is a mildish metabolic acidosis with a low phosphorus. And I think yes. everybody has got the diagnosis, Dr. Musa Kuti, Dr. Padani Raman, Dr. Bharani and Sanjay. Mm -hmm. I think this is a classical picture. So again, Look at urine routine and look for glucose. And you have said a specific thing, photophobia. Yes. What are we looking at here? So this was what we saw on the slit lamp, slit lamp examination. And it shows cystine crystal. So Dr. Bahani has mentioned cystinosis. Yes. So I think many of our messages have really gone through mm -hmm. to there. And uh, if I may just ask, what, what is the treatment of choice uh, in children? With the drug of choice and the treatment of choice, uh, if I may... So what are the treatment? Anybody would like to add? We are waiting for response. This is out of course. Okay. Systamine therapy is used. Systemic as well as oral. I'm sorry. Eye drops both. Uh, they will not. Is available. And the ultimate will probably need a kidney transplant. Okay. That's it. Thank you. So I think uh, that was a wonderful uh, presentation. And uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Vibha and uh, Dr. Zwani for this interesting discussion. Uh, I'll request all of you to have a look at our website, at our various courses, our publications, uh, our learning portal, as well as the mobile application, which is available. And uh, at that point, I'll close this session and see if there are any specific questions uh, other than this, which are there on that perspective. Because initially, I think there was good questions which were there. Dr. Linda is asking, what about a patient with rickets that has been on medication for three months yet to come for checkup, default treatment for two months yet to come for review? How do you manage such a patient? So if somebody has a big issue in terms of compliance, that is the only other indication other than maladsorption where we consider giving an injectable vitamin D single dose or a stoss therapy which will work in that regards. Dr. Shubha is mentioning child with rickets come to us has taken treatment for many doctors. Should we do vitamin D level first? What level of vitamin D diagnosed vitamin deficiency rickets? So if there's a long history of treatment, there is not line of healing. Maybe getting a vitamin D will be of help. But usually you're already dealing with refractory rickets in that scenario. So I think uh, we have had a very fruitful discussion and we'll close the session here. And uh, we will have next month a session on RTA as part of our 